Tänään meillä on hyvin erityislaatuinen vieras. Hän on punalainen munkki Helmut Kassner. Käymme tämän keskustelun englanniksi, joten siirryn nyt englannin kielen. Welcome, Helmut. You are a Buddhist, Buddhist monk, but you haven't always been that. So how you became in the first place in, as a Buddhist monk? I was always very interested in understanding life and precisely and so when reaching about the age of 13, 14, asking a lot of questions and not receiving satisfying answers. Then I studied electronics in Zurich, Technical University, and had a great chance to meet one of the most exceptional masters that was Geshe Raftun Rinpoche. So we asked him for teachings and uh, it was very interesting to hear explanations on life, on past existences, future existences, topics that we would just place in the domain of religion, where I was used to have the attitude where either you believe it or forget it. So there was very logical, very clear. I also asked questions and the answer was always very short, precise and fitting whatever had been said. And so profound that I had to think more deeply before asking the next question. So this was so fascinating for me that uh, after finishing my studies, I was only 22 years old, I thought I'm much too young to work. So I wanted to really speak with this great master in his own language. So I moved in the vicinity of this master to learn the Tibetan language. Well, that must be a very difficult language, I believe. I think for Central Europeans, Finnish may be a difficult language. <laughs> so it <laughs> must be something similar because the language by itself is very profound, but also it has easy aspects. Mm. And, but it is also completely different. Mm. So that is the main challenge at the beginning. So you were uh, following uh, your inner uh, intuition uh, about this and you wanted to move there. And so what did you find? Well, the one of the first things that surprised me was the uh, logic. That was, I was learning uh, the debate system as it is done in the great Buddhist universities in Tibet. And of course, having studied at the technical university, you are used to precision. But there, in our Western science, it is always a question of measuring, observing, and then translating it into mathematics. Mathematics is a very good system, very logical. You find your results and then you have to reinterpret your results back into what it mo should mean, could mean in nature. So I was taught by my great teachers at the university that this is really the uh, most uh, delicate point of our science. There most of the errors occur. Now this Buddhist logic was using no formulas, was just structured language, but in a very a uh, coherent manner and very precise manner. Also, every term used was defined very precisely. So the thought came, this exceeds what I had learned at uh, our universities and would be so useful also for our Western way of thinking and, uh, and investigating. So uh, you didn't uh, see any contradiction uh, between your uh, background and those uh, mathematical studies? And and, uh, but you found somehow gateway to the, between those two subjects. That's a very uh, suitable question you ask. Uh, 
Of course, the subject is different. The subject of uh, electronics is matter, electricity, and the subject of Buddha's uh, teachings is the mind. Mm -hmm. But I found the approach of uh, really analyzing, trying to find out what is there, what is not, was very similar. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I started to realize that a number of understandings I had gained in our Western studies, they were kind of challenging with regards to Buddha's teachings and sometimes helpful, sometimes learning more about the way to think in Buddha's teaching helped me to understand what I did not really understand deeply at university. Mm -hmm. I managed, I passed all the exams, even good grades, but I must say there was not really deep understanding. And it became deeper on the basis of uh, studying uh, Buddha's teachings. Mm -hmm. Buddha's teachings uh, can be seen a very, uh, let's say, uh, abstract things as mathematics can be and those subjects. So, was this abstraction uh, which creates this connection between them? Not really. Uh, I think abstract is not a suitable word here because teachings are to be used on one's own mind, mm -hmm. so really to be implemented. Like also in, when you do technical studies, finally it is to be implemented to make something. Mm. So that's quite similar. Uh, but what kind of... Uh, well, the, the field of electricity mm. is a subtle field. Mm. And mind is even more subtle. So there the approaches kind of uh, are challenging and interesting. And you find anal analogies between the two. Mm. So, what was the next step when you entered there and started to develop, of course, the skill, uh, the language skills, and uh, then uh, you uh, came uh, more into the Buddhist uh, philosophy? And what was the next step uh, there? After uh, spending some time around this master, uh, I read one teaching he had given in India to Western disciples, and it was on our life our death, the reality that we will all die, that we have no knowledge of the moment of death, and that what is important at the time of death. Whatever you have known in this life, whatever you have done in this life, whatever you have gained in this life, it is all finished. Mm. So what is really important was the question. So the important thing that will determine how one will, uh, the, the important thing that will determine how we will continue beyond that is the imprints of positive and negative actions. Mm -hmm. So these two things I was reflecting about and uh, that moved me very much. Just mm -hmm. this very, it was also the blessing of the master really to not just leave it at an intellectual point, but that it really kind of grabs you that you are going to die and you don't know when. Mm -hmm. And then came the thought, well, how do I make some proper use of this life? And uh, then came the idea to also follow the lifestyle of the great masters, asked him to become a monk. Yes, so was this uh, uh, decision uh, easy to make or did you have some uh, second thoughts about it? Once I had really understood the reality of death, it seemed the only logical uh, step to take. So, uh, if we're talking about those essential teachings, uh, what uh, Buddhism uh, teaches to us, uh, and if we are talking about the special this moment of death, what is this main idea what uh, Buddhism will teach about it? We all go to sleep every night, isn't it? But in Western science we know fairly little about sleep. This is already explained very precisely in Buddha's teachings. It is a, a dissolution of the gross aspects of our mind. The mind withdraws from using the outer sense organs, like the eyes, ears, and so on. So this mind that is usually completely connected to the body withdraws a little bit, becomes more subtle, one says. Now when we die, a similar process happens. Only the process of the solution goes much further and every step by step every link between the body is being dissolved. There are eight steps of this dissolution until the final step is actually death. 
and end of breathing is only the fourth out of these eight. Mm -hmm. So this is completely uh, new to me and uh, very precise, very clear. And in this process we lose our memory and the uh, only thing that remains are these imprints, these karmic imprints, the imprints of our actions and some tendencies from things we like to do, we are much involved with and so on. And after that follows an intermediate state, which is quite similar to our experience of dream. Okay, at night we have deep sleep states and then we have states where we dream where the sleep is a little bit lighter. The mind becomes a little bit more gross. This leads to these uh, intermediate states. And the images in our dreams are a result of these imprints in the mind, the imprints of our past days, weeks, months, even past lives. They produce all of these pictures and these involvements. And apparently after the mind has left the body, it again takes a more gross state and it is driven by these imprints that come to fruition, they ripen. And they produce also all sorts of images and our desires are one of the main factors that brings them to fruition. And we have a desire to exist in a more, in a gross manner, in a physical form. And this pushes us to our next incarnation, next life. And if we have the karmic potentialities accumulated to take again rebirth as a human, which is said to be not easy at all, then it would be at the moment, or usually at the moment of um, uniting of the cells of the future parents, mm -hmm. that one feels attracted to this sit, uh, spot and uh, some emotions occur and the being again experiences a death state, which means dissolution to the most subtle point. Mm -hmm. Next moment, the continuity of mind is linked with this fertilized cell. And then there is body and mind together, so new next life has started. Well, it sounds very fascinating. Uh, I'm just wondering that uh, uh, if uh, you thought about those uh, little stages about there, that uh, uh, like it's like a dream-like, this death, how much we are aware of ourselves, how much we have consciousness there. Just like in dreams, which means when we dream, we think that whatever appears to us is reality. And when we wake up, we see it's not. Well, uh, personally, I have gone through dreams that I have woken up with full consciousness inside of the dream, and I'm aware that my body is sleeping. So is this kind of phenomenon normally, uh, normally explained in Buddhism uh, philosophy? I imagine that there are many such uh, experiences explained. I'm not capable of relating it to particular texts. Mm. And uh, it is not completely common, so not everybody will have such experiences, but uh, there are many possibilities in our dreams. And even one can train the mind to gain control of the uh, dream state and use it actively. Yes. This intermediate state is said to be generally full of fears and anxieties and instability. Mm -hmm. So fairly bad dream. Mm -hmm. Now persons with very strong positive potentialities, they may experience it in a very soft manner, in a very fairly easy manner. Mm -hmm. But it is that state that can throw one in completely different existences, like one can take rebirth as an animal and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're thinking about that, uh, our uh, next reincarnation, would be like that to the animal. Uh, what it will teach then? What, what is the teachings for it? That is what we try to prevent. Because uh, existing in one of these states, like animals and so on, they are full of sufferings, and, uh, but the most important problem is that you have no capacity by yourself to get out of it again. That's the bigger problem. Yes. So this is the big advantage of our present existence as a human. This is the actual tremendous value of our present existence, that we can think very clearly. We have a tendency of being compassionate. And these are the main factors for development of the mind. So now is the chance to really change our future 
and to set the conditions so that the future existences will lead us from one good situation to the next. That's what we hope for, that's what we try to. Well, I hope that will, will come for everyone. Uh, what is the, those methods, what we should do, what is those ways and what we should do that uh, our next life will be much better than this, like uh, uh, that not so much suffering or something like this. Not mention that the suffering is not so bad because it's teaching us. So. <laughs> This is very true what you say. There is one good quality about suffering. That is that it can teach us, we can learn from it, we can make an effort to overcome it. So there are good effects, definitely. But finally it does not correspond to what we want. We spend all our life wishing and making effort to avoid them. And it seems there is the possibility to reach a stable state of happiness. So that would be the fulfillment of all our efforts of many, many past existences. Mm -hmm. So it's worth striving for that. Now if you ask what are the methods, the basic necessity for taking birth as a human is to follow a proper ethical behavior. Mm -hmm. And that means not to do any harm to any other beings. Mm -hmm. Very simply said, more elaborately said, it is uh, not to kill, also not to kill mosquitoes and so on, not to steal, and no sexual misconduct, not to lie, not to uh, do divisive speech, like speaking in a way so that friends become enemies. No harsh speech, like no speaking that hurts others. And no meaningless gossip. Yeah. These are seven points to avoid. And then there are three kind of sources that bring this about, and that is a sort of uh, a desire, longing for having for oneself, mm -hmm. and uh, evil mind wishing to harm, and then just wrong views, just having completely wrong views about reality. These lead to all of these seven negative behaviors. Mm -hmm. So these must be avoided. Yeah. I <laughs> agree this totally. And uh, well, when we watching uh, our reality in uh, nowadays uh, we are living a little bit uh, difficult times uh, for a human being to develop sure there is always a chance but uh, people are a little bit uh, self uh, centered nowadays and so on. but uh, what do you think uh, about uh, between different religions that uh, their essence what they are teaching so I have somehow thought that they are doing the same things in, the, in those uh, uh, principles of their teachings. So what is your opinion, Anna? Well, to repeat what the great masters have uh, explained is a true the, the center of a true religion will be compassion. Mm -hmm. Compassion means to wish that beings do not suffer. Mm -hmm. And it can be on many levels. It can be just wishing for this. It can be taking active role in bringing that about, or it can be a dedication of all one's efforts just to take the responsibility of bringing every being out of suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think compassion at various levels should be the core of a true religion. And if you look at the uh, great religions of this world, we will find this uh, in most of them. We do. Yeah. Uh, just, uh I'm wondering that uh, in uh, Buddhism uh, there is also in a very big uh, role given for uh, meditation and uh, way, different ways to do, uh, control your mind and calm your mind. Can you tell about more about this? I think our Western word meditation is a little bit misleading and it's not very precise uh, in the um, content that is kind of associated by various peoples with this word. The word used in Tibetan language or in Sanskrit language is much more kind of telling itself what it's about. And the word is just habit, mm -hmm. habituating the mind. Mm -hmm. It's something we're doing all the time. We're always habituating our mind to good qualities, to bad qualities. It is a nature of the mind that whatever we bring 
about as a state of mind. That means what we think again and again becomes more and more familiar, comes more and more easy. So the process of meditation is to put the mind into a wholesome state, a positive state, which can be many different things, and then bring it about again and again and intensify that so that at the end it becomes a natural character of the mind, like a quality of uh, compassion. Like somebody who has very strong compassion, then whatever situation it is, whatever being the person meets, be it somebody that seems agreeable, not agreeable, the only intention that arises in such a person will be, may this being be free of suffering, so it will be expressed in the way of speaking, the way of treating the person, one will be kind. If one is being attacked, be it verbally or whatever, the same will be the reaction. One will feel, may this being find peace of the mind, one will react in a calm manner, in a manner that will try to calm down the disturbances in the mind of the person. So that's what we are trying to reach, such good qualities increasingly trained in the mind so that they become a character of ourselves. So basically you don't need uh, some uh, ritualistic forms to practicing it or is it uh, so that uh, you are looking for a state of mind, meditative state of mind in every second what you are living in this world that you can always enter with peace? It is correct that we do not read, need any ritualistic activities. If they are used, in a, they can be very profound, they can help this process of meditation. But by themselves they are not absolutely necessary at all. And it is a process of just bringing about again and again the correct states of mind. First of all, of course, have to learn, observe the mind, understand which states are positive, which are negative, and then make continuous effort to bring it about, which will be very often a failure. So especially you try when you're quiet, you think in a proper way, the mind becomes positive and you try to strengthen this state, and you go out into the world and someone says blah, 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 and you feel blah, 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 and finished. Yeah. So the old reactions come very quickly. Yeah. So then you have to realize immediately, I am again off track. Stop, you have blah, blah, withdraw, leave whatever victory the other has in his speaking, leave it to him and bring back your positive state of mind. So that's the battle one is fighting. I can imagine that because um, mind is so active when you have something which uh, has created some uh, emotions. Example. Exactly. It's put minds uh, rolling so fast. And yes, so. yes. Uh, if I can ask you a little bit uh, <coughs> uh, from the side, uh, side of the topic. I used to uh, read uh, one interesting book uh, from 1930s. Uh, there was Paul Pluntan, who was uh, looking for those uh, uh, Buddhism uh, philosophy, Hindu philosophy and, uh, and so on. And uh, what he discovered was uh, uh, higher consciousness. Uh, how you define or see uh, that kind of? Well, this is very precisely described. So, on our state, first we have to gain a little bit more control over the mind by strengthening the positive factors of compassion, loving kindness, patience, and most of all just to be satisfied whatever we have and not to always demand more and uh, follow all our desires. So this will make the mind more calm. And then if possible also to realize this egoistic attitude that you had mentioned, which is so harmful. It's not easy to recognize it. On the gross level, yes, mm. but it exists on much subtler levels. And when we, one may think, I'm not such an egoistic person, if one has understood through the teachings of the great masters and looks carefully, one sees it's always me, my, myself, that's at the center <laughs> of all of our thoughts and actions. So if one can re recognize this error and start to work a little bit against it. Again, this helps a lot. Now at one point, one will reach 
the uh, necessary qualities to really develop the strength of the mind very directly by increasing the power of concentration. Mm -hmm. That's concentrative uh, meditation, which does nothing else but train this potentiality of concentration that we all have. We all can concentrate up to a certain point. Now this can be developed to a point that for us seems quite supernatural. One can place the mind on any object, it will stay there, it will not go away by itself. Disturbing factors of the mind will no longer arise because the concentration completely kind of neutralizes them. And the interaction of body and mind is in such harmony that a continuous well-being and bliss is being experienced. Now this is only the beginning. For us already quite supernatural. One can then on the basis of that develop qualities like perceiving the mind of others, perceiving more subtle things, perceiving things in the past and in the future, controlling various aspects of the body like uh, intake of uh, food. It's possible even to live without taking gross food. Things like that. Now, all one has achieved at that point that is really full control over the mind. One can uh, unite all the force of the mind. Something similar happens when we go to sleep. The mind is withdrawn from the outer senses, so it is kind of collected. And then, very unfortunately, we kind of pass out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, in the, with the power of concentration, it also collects the force of the mind from the senses. The mind is withdrawn and it, with full clarity. And then you have the full power of mind at your disposal. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can do many things. You can increase the power of compassion ever more by just reflecting on the dependence on others, the kindness of others, how much we have benefited for, from others, and uh, thereby wishing that they be free from any suffering due to feeling very close, mm -hmm. like to family members. Or you can analyze reality. Most important then is analysis of what is me? What is this ego? Mm -hmm. What is really there which is me? How does it appear to me? What is in what appears to me just projection? Mm -hmm. And what is actual existence of myself? I do exist, no question. Mm -hmm. But our idea of me is, let's say, 99% projection. So this one has first to distinguish. And then one uses logic to see the error in that. And then reach to a point where one sees only what actually exists. That is the basic method for developing true wisdom, which will then at one point just eliminate the basis for all these wrong factors of mind like hatred, desire and so on. Yeah. If that is brought then to a... Um, complete state, then for the first time such wrong factors will leave the mind forever. They will never come back again. At that moment a bliss, a pure bliss, a pure happiness is also experienced and the being becomes a superior being. From then on will continue to liberation, to perfection uh, there with absolute certainty. So these can all be called at various levels, superior states of mind, superior states of consciousness. If we're thinking about, uh, let's say, that the human spirit develop, development, uh, what role is given for intuition or s sensitivity? The word intuition can mean various things. The way I've understood it is that you come into a situation and you think something is there, something is happening that you cannot really see, yeah. but you have a strong conviction that's what's going on. Like uh, you see somebody just looking a certain way and then you have the idea, well, he likes that person, he dislikes that person, he has this intention or that. Uh, the idea that you have may be right and may be wrong. It's, there's no certainty in these intuitions. Mm. 
on the basis of experience, and uh, some people have very, are very sensitive, as you say, for such perceptions, they may be, wrong, may be right sometimes, but there is no clarity, no, no security. So it is said not to rely on those, you know, just to try to remain clear and specific. Don't worry too much about uh, a way of looking or just a gesture and so on. And what is reliable, on the contrary, that is developing, on the basis of perfect concentration, the capacity to really see what is the intention. It is possible to see the mind of others, mm -hmm. to see their intentions, their potentialities, and that is like a perception. You know that is there, there is no uncertainty. Mm -hmm. That is reliable. That, that I don't think it can be called intuition. That is uh, heightened awareness or clairvoyance. Some uh, old writings, uh, as uh, Paul Prunton uh, has written, that uh, intuition can be also one way to listening uh, higher consciousness. I don't know. I'll tell you another, I'll tell you another story. <laughs> uh, when one has the great fortune to meet uh, one of these truly extraordinary masters, these are people that have such capacities. They really see which state you experience, what are your potentialities. So when you are in daily life, then meet all sorts of uh, conditions. And then sometimes all of a sudden a thought occurs. Some, if it's a positive thought or kind of an, a new idea, it could be, things could be like this or like that. There is the possibility that such uh, positive, constructive uh, thoughts that arise all of a sudden without any clear kind of uh, reason to be noticed, they are the influence of the Master. They are the influence of the uh, or blessing of the Master. Now if you want to uh, call the mind of, the, of a great master, superior consciousness, I think it's suitable. Mm -hmm. And to a faithful disciple, definitely such things will happen. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example where we might say yes. Yeah, well, this is uh, what I also thought that uh, when this kind of intuition comes without the uh, effect of uh, surrounding nature or some actions where we are, that it comes without those uh, uh, effects, that uh, it's something which doesn't belong to that situation. Yeah. This but of course, there might be little bit differences, uh, make the difference which, which comes from your yeah. own yeah, exactly. mind, exactly. <laughs> imagination and so on. Uh, such impulses can be very helpful. One just has to be aware that, as you say, they could be coming from one's own uh, deluded mind. So just check them against what is proper behavior and what not. So and then you will immediately see whether it was a positive impulse or a useless one. Mm -hmm. If it's a positive one, then, as you say, just follow it. It will be good. Yes. Uh, you were uh, lecturing uh, in ultra private uh, in the weekend, and uh, your topic was uh, uh, inner balance. Can you Tell more about it, that subject. Very often people are in a disturbed state, a turmoil. This is our basic way of existing. We have this, ten this very basic tendency that whenever we encounter something that produces a disagreeable sensation, we react with aversion and if it gets stronger with anger and wish to destroy it to remove it. Whenever we encounter agreeable things and objects, we have the wish to link it to us, to possess it, not to lose it. So that is attachment and desire. So these are both states of mind and they are both disturbed states of mind. And they disturb also the subtle energies which are so closely connected with our body and our mind. So this is the way we live all the time. Sometimes people get more easily angry and some very strongly angry, some very attached, very f much full of desire, some less. In either way then there will be 
continuous disturbance within us, which is very um, kind of disagreeable by itself. We hardly know any other state. So whatever effort we make to change that, we should try to reduce our strong desires and our uh, e easily getting irritated. So these are the two main things that we need to work against. So this is done by developing factors of the mind that work against this. Now, if you really cherish somebody, you really like somebody, not for using the person, more like a mother cherishes her child. The mother just wishes for the happiness of the child. It doesn't expect any re reply or gra uh, gratitude from the child. So if you know such a state of mind, maybe towards your own children or towards your parents, then observe your mind. It is a kind of clean state of mind, a calm state of mind. That is this uh, gratitude, recognizing the benefit one has gained from the person, which leads to a positive state of mind. And that will by itself be an antidote against uh, many things, but among others against anger. So a person that you cherish will not be the cause for you to arise in anger so easily. While those that you f don't like, you feel irritated about, you don't appreciate at all, you have no respect for, if they do something you don't like, immediately anger comes up. So that's the way to find more balance, by developing these positive qualities, which will step by step take away the force of these negative ones, and in that way the mind becomes more uh, in peace, and um, less often disturbed. And once you get a feeling of that, then you long for that and you see how these other f states of mind are harmful. And then one becomes even more alert to recognize them when they come and makes even more effort to avoid them as soon as they arise. And then you're in a good way. Then you will attain more and more stability for sure. Well, this is what I uh, exactly... Uh, thought that uh, it would be uh, good <coughs> and I'm thinking this is also one way to how you discover when your ego do the work and how you can clear ego's effect on your actions, on your thoughts and and uh, as as you came here you uh, you was acting a very uh, unegoistic way that you helped me to carry those things uh, you and you are the quest here, you are our <laughs> visitor, you are our, <laughs> mm. our, <coughs> well, our guest. And you are that kind of person that you would like to help things and uh, put echo away. And uh, this is, I guess, what all, all about is. That's the core, yes. That's very much the core of our efforts, mm. to see how this very deeply grounded uh, egoistic attitude is always in our way, which this is the most harmful. Yeah. Out of that comes all of our negative actions, all our conflicts, all our conflicts also in the family, all our unhappy states. Mm. So try to reduce it, yes, but one has to learn how. And uh, the teachings of the great masters need to be heard again and again. One needs to reflect deeply. One needs to observe one's mind, to see how it is this negative attitude that kind of pushes in everywhere and causes all of the trouble. And it's a very subtle way, very unnoticeably. So one needs to be quite alert and, and reflect on the happenings in one's mind when one is in a calm state. Remember, you, I said this, what was the emotion that led to it? What had been said before? You will always find there is this me, ego, I, that kind of pushed a certain answer, a certain reaction. Now one can replace it by just a spontaneous, deep wish for the happiness of the others. Yeah. Then things are on a good way. <laughs> yes, and that will bring the compassion yes. to the surround of you. And, uh, yes. and that will bring your inner enlightenment. 
but also for others. It will lead to a continued improvement of qualities and that ultimately will be the state of perfection which is called enlightenment. Would you like to tell more about this enlightenment state? What is it all about? Then? I, I, I have assumed that uh, it's usually just a short moments what you can go through it, but uh, what you are longing for is that it should be a permanent state of mind. That's very true. It is a permanent state that one is seeking and it is not at all in our reach to get there. We have now, as a, with the human existence, all the potentialities to set a starting point for that. And that's what we are capable of doing. And it's not just a short moment of understanding something. Despite this word being used uh, in such a manner in our societies, the word that we actually mean to translate with this word enlightenment is the word Buddha, the Sanskrit word Buddha, which has a very precise meaning. It has two aspects of meaning. It is used for waking up and for blossoming. So a person that is called a Buddha is a person that has been completely awoke, or a person that has completely awoke from this deep sleep of ignorance. So there's no ignorance left whatsoever. And all of the qualities like wisdom, compassion, and ability have been developed to a perfect state without anything more that could be developed. So this is a perfect way of existing and the way of existing is completely different to the way we exist at the present moment. Like our, the characteristic of our existence is we go through our life, inevitably we experience death, after that again birth, again death, again birth. Within our life we have no freedom over our destiny. So many things will just happen to us. How much careful we are, we will get into trouble here and there. This is the nature of our existence. Mm. The source for that way of existing is our basic lack of freedom over our destiny, over our mind. And that one tries to change step by step and to reach a state where one has complete liberty over one's existence. And this is, of course, done by training the mind, gaining, first of all, liberty over one's own mind. That's the very first step. And this is a long development. So it is said that, um, generally, a being developing from our state up to the state of full enlightenment takes the time of three countless eons. Countless is not countless, it's a number. It is a 10 with uh, 59 zeros after it. And uh, it is three of them. And an eon is not a year or a decade. It is the time of a universe coming into existence, existing, and then dissolving again. So really, really long time. But it can be achieved, apparently also shorter, in this time of Buddha Shakyamuni giving very, very effective methods, but for these effective methods to be effective, one needs an effective disciple. And that is so difficult to become. <laughs> what is this uh, period of... Uh, eons. eons. Eons, they call it. It's like a wave of, waves of ocean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's uh, waves of existences. It is said that uh, a world like our world, and I think it refers to galaxy, like our galaxy, the Milky Way, is something that starts to develop at a certain point out of energy, like in our uh, physics, energy transforming into the shape, uh, into matter. So it develops, has a long period of development. And then there is a very long period of existence. And in that time, then beings live in this uh, world. And then there comes a time when this starts to dissolve and then again does not exist only in the form of energy. And that period is called uh, eon. Well, that is fascinating. Uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, uh, human development and uh, 
we all know that okay our body is under evolution but it seems that our spirit is also under evolution evolution of consciousness evolution of perception and evolution of well being <laughs> Well, looking around uh, our developments of the world for the past 50 years, I don't really see where we are very much on the path of improvement. Yeah. As well, body as well as mind. Yeah. As you have already mentioned very clearly, people have become more egoistic than they may have been. Yeah. This is not an improvement. Yeah, I, I, but in, I was thinking about this idea that uh, what we should have, uh, that we should have this kind of, not, not evolution just for a physical level, but also for our uh, spirit should go through. It is very true that we need also improvement of our qualities. Mm. And again, there you don't see much improvement. Mm. Like, remember in, when I was a youngster, there were people that got angry, there were people that maybe had sometimes rage, but rare. But there was not this almost constant easy irritation mm. like now when you just listen or even you watch movies you know people have a, a way of answering which already contains irritation mm. this was not there so this is something that has developed in the past decades maybe to the stress of this all the, our life with all of these possibilities so all of that uh, i think we are more on a Pass of uh, degeneration at the moment. Yeah. Degeneration means the negative qualities of mind increase. Yeah. We are f much more full of desire than we ever used to. Mm. Well, our whole economy functions on the basis of instigating desire. Mm. So our advertising, what are they doing? There is a happy person that thinks has everything it needs. Mm. Relaxed, and then there comes the advertising of some product and he looks at that and says, oh, it seems I don't have everything. I still need something. So it creates a longing for something. Yes. And then, of course, one has to work for that, has to do and get that, mm -hmm. which means a person that feels it has everything is a rich person, mm -hmm. isn't it? As soon as you have the impression that you are lacking something, lacking something is the characteristic of being poor. So it's creating mental poverty by creating constant idea one needs something more. Mm. And this, of course, creates a lot of uh, activity and disturbances in the mind of the beings. So that's, I think, what's happening very much with us. And this is one strong factor of the degeneration. Well, this is uh, true to what you say, that uh, we are noticing very easily those what is missing, but we don't mm. see those what we have. That's <laughs> very true what you say. So we take the consequence and uh, start to develop a mind that remembers everything that we have from morning to evening. Ignore what seems to be missing still, like if you have a, a telephone, be happy with it. If you have enough to eat, remember this is a great situation. If you have a place to live, remember this is great. Don't worry about having a bigger one, nicer one, whatever. So being content with what we have, r realizing the great fortune we have. Actually, we're living in a time of, in one aspect, in a, of great, great fortune. Yes. Everybody has enough to eat, in our uh, reach at least. Yes. And uh, people are... Uh, they don't uh, lead heavy wars uh, where we are in, in Europe at least at the moment and uh, there is a, gen a general kind of uh, tendency to strive for agreements rather than for conflicts mm -hmm. and one has the chance of uh, education from small on every kind of education is available which makes the, the people clever and sharp which is on the one hand very good. It, has, it poses a few dangers, but in general it is quite good. It also allows the people to analyze, to reflect, to have a clear um, view on things. 
So all of these are not given. All of these are a very good situation of our times. So if we remember them, we'll be happy. If we remember that these are precious, we will use them in a proper way. And that will be to develop the good qualities of the mind. Then everything is the good way. Thank you, Helmut. You have given all the tools what we need for developing our self and our spirit and our mind to be a better person. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was nice. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.